Last September, Dubliners lined the River Liffey to witness Ireland's first flight fest. It was a celebration of Ireland's enduring fascination with the world of flight, a fascination born, in part at least, out of the country's geographical position on the western edge of Europe. In many ways, the epic story of aviation in Ireland mirrors nearly a century of the Irish state and its unfolding relationship with the outside world. Today, Ireland is a truly global centre of the aviation industry. It is a remarkable achievement for a small country, but it's an achievement that was hard won and long in the making. The desire to fly is as old as recorded history, but it is only during the last century that the dream has finally become a reality. From the very earliest days of flight, pioneers and aviators were drawn to its heady fusion of technology and adventure. Ireland too had its early trailblazers, among them legendary figures such as Henry Ferguson, Lillian Bland, Dennis Corbett Wilson and Lady Mary Heath. Their triumphs and their failures captured the public's imagination in Ireland and beyond. In the decades to come, the world would move from dreaming of flight to the reality of a global village connected by a virtual world of communication and a physical world of constant motion across the flight paths of the globe. One misty Sunday morning, in the wake of a devastating world war, and amidst a guerrilla conflict being waged against British rule in Ireland, a modified Vickers bomber emerged out of the clouds off the Galway coast. But this was not an act of war. It was an act of extraordinary daring and sheer belief. For in June 1919, John Alcock and Arthur Whitten Brown crash-landed on a bog outside Clifton completing the first non-stop transatlantic flight in history. For the first, but certainly not the last time, metaphorically and geographically, Ireland had become the centre of global aviation. The history of that, I mean, as a child, I remember my father bringing me over to show me where the patch of bog where they landed, you know, it was always a fascinating thing here, for me anyway, and I'm sure for other kids as well, the area, you know? It was historic and it was, you know, kind of, uh, they revered these guys who were the intrepid explorers of the air at the time. So they, they would have been heroes in the region, you know, for, I, I always thought it was a fascinating business. But, um, you know, farming took uh, precedence at that time, you know. After the success of Alcock and Brown flying east across the Atlantic, many eyes were now turning toward the more difficult return journey. The transatlantic flight westward from Europe to North America was a more dangerous prospect, flying head-on into the relentless prevailing winds. During the next decade, many would try and many would fail, some tragically so. Among them was a young pilot, James Fitzmaurice. Like many Irishmen, the debonair Fitzmaurice had flown with the RAF during the First World War and returned to the fledgling Irish state to join the newly formed Irish Air Corps at an old British Air Force base at Baldonnell, outside Dublin. Earlier, during the Anglo-Irish treaty negotiations in London, the Irish rebel government was surprisingly alert to the potential of the airways across Ireland. 
But if you look at the memoranda that Erskine Childers and others draw up on the Irish side, they're conscious that aviation will be important uh, in the coming decades. And they see that Ireland can be a staging post on the developing transatlantic air routes. Britain doesn't seem to be aware of this. And you'll notice from reading that the 1921 treaty, there's no mention of aviation, there's no mention of airspace. And Ireland gets full control of its airspace under the 1921 treaty and is able to use that accordingly through the 20s and 30s. With the British concerned about ruling the waves, the omission of any mention of flight from the Anglo-Irish Treaty would open the skies for the Irish government in the coming years. During the treaty negotiations, the Irish government-in-waiting also purchased its very first aircraft. So it was a Martin Soy Toy Bay, and uh, it was kept on standby in Britain to bring, to bring Michael Collins home from England during the treaty talks if they failed because there was a massive bounty on his head. But initially, the plan was to use an aircraft to bomb locations in England. And this is not very well known. But while they were formalising that plan, another plan was drawn up to get Michael Collins out of Britain if the treaty talks failed. And he would be brought back to either France or Ireland if the treaties failed. But the treaty was signed, as we know. So that was the first aircraft owned by the Irish Provisional Government. Throughout the early years of the Air Corps, Fitzmaurice had kept the momentous flight westward across the Atlantic in his sights. By 1927, he had risen up through the ranks to become a commandant, and that year also made a failed attempt to cross the Atlantic from Baldonnel. But the following year, when two German pilots came to Baldonnel, then Europe's most westerly airbase, to attempt the impossible crossing, Fitzmaurice seized his opportunity and offered to join the flight team. Cole and Van Hunfeld were the two German pilots. And the Germans had identified Ireland as the base to start from for geographical reasons again. And Baldonnel was considered to have a very good runway because this would require a, a long stretch to get off the ground. It was fully loaded up with fuel. And whatever way it was negotiated by the, either the Air Corps or the government, and Fitzmaurice was a fairly colourful character in his own right. Like he wasn't slow in coming forward, let's say and he, he became part of the team. And it became then a kind of an Irish government sponsored event as well. And uh, when they took off in that flight, you know, a lot of people were very skeptical they would actually be able to make it because the risks going west were, were very material. On the morning, if you read the newspaper transcripts or whatever, uh, lots of people turned up like the world media was here. Apparently, Fitzmaurice was a very apprehensive, which he normally wouldn't be. I read a report once where he was interviewed by a journalist and he was being asked about uh, how he felt. And usually he was very talkative, but he didn't say much. Like, you know, he was keeping himself to himself, kept checking the weather reports. And uh, when they took off, um, they took they got altitude quick and went off, you know, and they were followed a few minutes later by an air corps aircraft with uh, two pilots who couldn't catch up with them. And then they were seen off, I think, around Galway. People saw them off the Galway coast because they wouldn't have been flying very high. They would have been at a low altitude. Like, there was no radio on board, so there's no communication. Uh, so once they got out over the Atlantic, no one was going to know what happened to them until they landed, if they landed. If they landed in the sea, the chances are they would never be seen again. By the time the, the, the next day came around, people were starting to think that, uh, OK, we haven't heard that now. They're gone. It's over. They're lost, you know? But after 36 hours, news began to filter out from a remote outpost off the coast of Newfoundland. They kind of crashed on Green Islands, and as in more than landed. Like, the airplane was in a bit of a mess when they got down. But that was, that, was, that was a remarkable feat of uh, aviation at the time. And 
There's pictures of them getting ticker tape parades in New York and that sort of stuff. So, you know, these things at the time, these were the celebrity events at the time. The Bremen flight would be celebrated both in Ireland and throughout the world. It effectively opened the way for commercial transatlantic travel and Ireland would be perfectly located to benefit from this development. Fitzmaurice in particular envisaged this promising future and petitioned the Irish government to found a national airline. However, his calls fell on deaf ears and he later resigned from the Air Corps in frustration. He would later die in the mid-1960s in reduced circumstances and virtually forgotten. Other independent spirits also saw the potential for a national airline, among them an aviation enthusiast and engineer, Hugh Cahill, who set up Iona Airways. But he too failed to gain governmental support. Eventually, in 1934, a dynamic and outward-looking minister, Sean Lamas, finally set about establishing a national airline. And the inaugural flight left Baldonnel for Bristol on the morning of May 27th, 1936. Aer Lingus, as the new airline would come to be called, would need a home and Collinstown, an old British Air Force base north of Dublin, would be chosen. The latest city to build a great airport is Dublin and at Collinstown, just six miles north of the city centre, 700 acres are being developed as one of the world's most modern termini. Already the airport buildings are rising. The main block will house the all-important control tower, offices, banks, post offices and customs halls, while alongside will be the hangars, garages and subsidiary buildings. Construction on the new terminal began in 1937. And out across the field along the mile-long runways, the airliners will soon be roaring, bringing Ireland nearer to Europe, nearer to the new world, linking all nations in peace along the air lanes of the sky. In the decades since the Bremen flight, there had been rapid technological development and now seaplanes were able to go further and longer. American airlines were turning their thoughts towards Europe, where they saw a potentially lucrative future for a transatlantic service. And the legendary American aviator Charles Lindbergh was dispatched by Pan Am to choose the ideal landing site for their flying boats. Eamon de Valera, soon to become Taoiseach, and the iconic political figure in Irish life for many decades, took his first flight ever with Lindbergh when the aviation hero landed in Foynes, a small port in the mouth of the Shannon. De Valera would prove to be a powerful advocate for Irish aviation policy in the years ahead. So there's a realisation in the 1930s that Ireland needs to get a place on the international aviation stage because these aircraft, although they're a massive development on what was around during the First World War, they're still limited by range. And either, to make the flight in either direction, they will have to stop off at either their first landfall point or the final landfall point, and that is Ireland. Uh, Lindbergh, of course, had completed his non-stop flights and that was considered a real aviation hero. Uh, so he was the person that they sent off that would have the knowledge and the expertise. His wife was with him as well, by the way, when he came. And he looked at Cove, he looked at Galway. The government of Northern Ireland as well thinks that it might be able to develop a seaplane base on, on Loch Foil. Uh, Lufthansa at one stage are looking at building uh, an international airport uh, in the Cork area. And he decided along with other engineers and that, that Foynes was really the place that it should happen. For various reasons, we had the deep water, we had a port already in existence, and then we had the railway connection to Limerick City, uh, and we had a sheltered harbour. 
Foynes was to provide a unique link with North America, but also onwards to the Caribbean and South America. And so, for a brief period before and during the Second World War, this small west of Ireland port would become a global centre for aviation. Just across the island, we can hear the sound of the engines, which by this time have got into that amounts to a roar. You can hear that zooming noise coming across the waters, and there she appears just over the island, going marvellously and smoothly, just like a great big bird. It's an absolutely magnificent sight, with the sun glinting on the waters. Farewell, Clipper, and a good flight. Le Mans is very conscious in the 1930s that Ireland needs to get a place on the international aviation stage by, not by creating an airline, or even a transatlantic airline, but by creating a location that flying boats can land at. And Foynes, Rhinana, today Shannon, comes out of this. And Foynes is the temporary post while the much larger Rhinana is being built. There was a lot of things had to be put in place. Met service had to be put in place, radio operations, and radio operations at that time were all Morse code. So all of these facilities, fines became absolutely alive with all these facilities coming in and being set up here. I suppose Ireland at the time didn't have the expertise and the knowledge to, to run an airport. So uh, it was uh, BOAC, or Imperial Airways, as they were in the beginning, that were brought in here to actually run the airport by the government. The first flight into Foynes was on the 26th of February, 1937. It was a bitterly cold day. In fact, the snow was falling when Captain Taffy Powell landed the Cambria. So he was saying to me, he said he was sent over to uh, look at the operational base and also to see if the natives were friendly. A year after De Valera took his maiden flight with Lindbergh, he returned to Foynes as Taoiseach to welcome the first crossover of flights between Europe and North America. The local Mount Eagle Hotel was transformed into an airport terminal and would house both a state-of-the-art radio room and a weather station above its first-class restaurant. If you read some of the newspapers from that time, they'll tell you thousands of people came by train, by car, by bicycle. I've often heard people say they cycled 20, 30 miles to get to Vines to see a flying boat taken off for land. So um, it was booming here. One of the last surviving people who worked in Vines was ground hostess Lal Dowley. Now in her 90s, Lal lives here in Martha's Vineyard. You'll go out on the launch. It seems to my recollection that there were never more than 20 to 25 passengers. We'd escort the passengers to, there was a, a big shed on the dock and there was customs. Then there was a little room where Captain Ellis, who was head of, he was, I presume, Irish security. I would have a list of the passengers and you'd call them by name and they'd go in and get scrutinized. <laughs> um, and then we would bring them over to cross the street for breakfast. Dev came down here on a visit and he said, uh, who's running this restaurant? And they said, uh, the British. And he said, no, no, the British are not running an Irish restaurant. And he went back, and Sean Lamass knew about this very dapper young manager that was running a restaurant in Dublin, Muslim County Clare, called Brendan O'Regan. And they came to Brendan, they offered him the most extraordinary contract. To such an extent, the contract was so good that he felt guilty taking the money, and he gave back some to the state. Would you believe that? 
and Brendan O'Regan was to prove to be an astute choice. In the decades to come, he would be a key figure in the development of Irish tourism and industry in the Shannon region. All of us who were there at Fines felt we were kind of a first generation of Irish people who were getting a chance to show in an international setting that we could match others. We, we knew we had done it outside the country. People had gone to America and to England, but we hadn't done it at home. In fact, Fines, you know, the, uh, there wasn't a high degree of self-confidence in Ireland at that stage. And I think aviation that we succeeded lifted the morale greatly. That was a significant thing, I think, that happened. They always arrived early morning, as they still do. Uh, they did leave late at night, which was slightly different. Now, some of them would disperse to places in Ireland or maybe to Dublin or whatever, but others would be transiting. And they would go then onto um, Britain. Uh, maybe two or three hours later, the flight would take off again and take them on to Britain. Central to the success of this new and vital air link between Europe and America was the transport of airmail. Passenger transport was only of secondary importance. Because at the time, it was post that would actually give you the, the consistent revenue to justify operating these routes, and then you'd layer on passenger uh, services on top of that. While Foynes remained a peaceful, if increasingly cosmopolitan haven in neutral Ireland, the Second World War dominated life beyond its shores. In the early days of the Second World War, there's a watch set up around the coast. And these are manned 24 hours a day, seven days a week during the war. And their job, the men on duty there, are to record everything that they see or hear on the sea and in the skies above Ireland. And the war as it starts is rather slow moving. There's a sense that it'll be like the First World War, that the technological advances, there's no awareness of that, obviously. But as the war progresses and air technology becomes much more advanced, the men of the Coast Watching Service are recording what's happening with increasing regularity in the skies over Ireland. There are a lot of, to be kind of blasé about, there's a lot of aircraft in the skies over Ireland during the Second World War. In the early years of the war, German aircraft are coming in from over the Cork coast and they're going off into the Atlantic to attack convoys. I mean, every now and again, an aircraft, is, uh, an Irish aircraft is scrambled, but until we get hurricanes, uh, the, the Air Corps are too slow to be able to intercept these aircraft at all. Then by the middle years of the war, after America's entered the war, that the German uh, threat has been seen off, the Allies have superiority over Ireland, and it's traffic coming from west to east in preparation for D-Day and the Overlord landings. Within this uh, mass of Allied and Axis aircraft operating over Ireland during the war, there's the solitary Aer Lingus uh, de Havillands operating from Dublin to Liverpool, Manchester on some occasions, bringing diplomatic mail backwards and forwards, bringing high-profile passengers. That is Ireland. Ireland's one little presence in the sky in this um, massive conflagration that's, that's uh, across Europe and trying to keep Ireland's lifeline backwards and forwards to, uh, to the, the British mainland, if, if you like. Back in Dublin, the new terminal at Collinstown finally opened in 1941. And while flights were severely restricted by the war, this new modernist building designed by Desmond Fitzgerald would come to symbolise a hopeful new vision of a more outward-looking Ireland. In 1943, the Shorts Brothers Company, who had been building seaplanes for Imperial Airways, moved its operation from London to Belfast, from where they still operate today. But as the Second World War continued to rage across Europe and the world, the atmosphere in Foynes changed. This little village 
on the west coast of Neutral Ireland becomes an international air hub during the Second World War, where you've got representatives of Irish military intelligence, MI6, the OSS, the precursor to the CIA, all watching the aircraft coming in. You know, the flying boats kind of lumber in over Loop Head in the, the early hours of the, the day. And it's who's on it, what's happening, who's passing through. And G2, Irish military intelligence, keep a careful watch on all the passenger manifests. Uh, it becomes a very secretive world whereby uh, the flying boats are they're operating on a much more uh, limited service now and they're bringing strategically important passengers, they're bringing diplomatic mail, they're bringing important military officers through neutral Ireland and on to the UK or backwards to the, the USA, uh, down to Portugal. They're looking for looking at cargoes, looking at who's coming through. And I think in, in the, the people in Foynes keep this very much of a secret to themselves. It's, it's always amazed me how it doesn't leak out. Well, if in the first place we were sworn to not talk about anything away from where we were. And then, well, they were very strict on keeping it quiet. And of course, you went to Limerick and I'm sure they all knew where we all came from. We don't know necessarily who came through on all the flights. There's one very uh, more often told story down in Foynes that Churchill was on one of the aircraft that passed through, but he didn't, rather like Boris Yeltsin, he didn't get off. Uh, and the, uh, the uh, Churchill party are noted as being in Foynes, but not Churchill himself. You know, you could speculate he went on another aircraft or something, but Foynes is, is really a, a hub of intrigue during the, the Second World War. These were high-end travellers. They were uh, very well-heeled business people, Hollywood celebrities, um, government politicians, military people. There was the excitement of the famous people, you know, if the, if the, um, the Bob Hopes and all them were going to Europe and they went on a civilian flight, not a military, they had to come through here to go to Europe to entertain the troops. Gracie Fields was singing down in the harbour for the locals. Crazy feels. Wow. I haven't thought about these for years. Hemingway, John F. Kennedy, the late president, Edward G. Robinson came in. Ray Milland, Gertrude Lawrence, Peter Lilly. Well, I kind of say it was a mini Casablanca, you know, in that you had the refugees, you had the war effort, uh, you had the diplomats and the royalty. If you were sent to fines as your position with either BOAC or with Pan American or with American Export Airlines, uh, you made sure you stayed here. And you did a great job because war was raging across Europe, right? Food was plentiful enough here, even though they had a bit of bartering going on with the planes, that's another story. Life was very easy here. There wasn't any trouble, there was no war. So lots of the times when you read their accounts of being here, they had a really lovely time here and it was devastation when they finally left. May of 1945 saw the lights go on again. Germany had surrendered, the war in Europe was over, and the news triggered the greatest celebration the nation has ever known. With the international euphoria that accompanied the end of the Second World War, the skies were open again to commercial aviation. The industry would benefit from the technical advancements made during the war. These changes would spell the end for the seaplanes at Foynes and herald in an exciting new era of Irish aviation history. But for one glorious moment, Foynes had been the centre of the world. Leslie Mitchell reporting. An airfield has been laid out in West Ireland at Rinniana and named Shannon Airport for the great land planes with which the Americans have started their transatlantic services. To British hearts, it's a little ironical that as a consequence of our concentration on combat planes in the war, the United States is able to jump ahead so quickly in the struggle for commercial air business. 
Geography, of course, counts for more than sentiment in choosing sites for airfields, but it's another ironical thought that passengers to and fro across the Atlantic take off from error, not Britain. The advances made in aviation during the Second World War led to the rapid demise of the flying boat, and now the new focus of transatlantic air travel would move just across the Shannon, among the marshlands around Rangana. Soon, the newly renamed Shannon Airport would become the gateway between Europe and the Americas. In the aftermath of the war at the Chicago Aviation Convention, many of the nations of the world came together to establish ground rules for the rapidly developing business of civil aviation. But on the fringes of these lengthy negotiations, Irish civil servants brokered a unique deal. They signed a bilateral agreement with the USA ensuring that Shannon would be their landing site of choice. The ramifications of this deal would be felt for decades to come. Churchill in particular reacted very badly to that news because they at the time were pitching to have Prestwick or some other airport in the UK mainland to be used as this kind of hub and Shannon got it. Now, geographically, Shannon was better positioned, but you have to believe there's an Irish-American angle to this. The Americans want an agreement with the Irish because they need to have a staging post in Europe for their airlines, but they don't want it to be in the UK because of political differences and differences of opinion over the transatlantic route. They'd rather have it in a neutral location, and Ireland is, is good for this. And there's a feeling that they can kind of play politics with the Irish. The Americans realized fairly soon after the ink was dry on the agreement that the Irish, Irish had pulled a fast one on them, and that they were now locked into Shannon. And that's the case up until 1957. All aircraft crossing the Atlantic land in Shannon. And secondly, Ireland also it gets agreement that Shannon will be the control base for transatlantic air traffic control. The Shannon region, once a rural backwater, was now gradually transforming into a booming hub of international activity. The first big impression I had was the lights. I mean, there was no electricity around at the time. But when they switched on the lights, it was a plane coming, or a plane going out. It was, I uh, was looking into a big black hole one minute, and the next thing, the whole place lit up. It was hard to visualize what it would be like, but all around it was bleak countryside. And when you got to Shannon, there seemed to be lots of activity in uh, a, a near a decade that had very little activity generally in the country. No, oh, sure, it's, a, it's a deep place to go over Sunday ever before I came to work here. We used to be out there in the field hunting hares for the coursing. That was a big day out, you know. You would hear a plane, you, you, you would see the tower flashing. That was a big thing in our life, especially at night. You'd be out to see this, this Shannon Airport. Ryan Anna was known as, not, uh, you know, not Shannon, Ryan Anna, you know, and, and uh, another the country, the air base, you know. A few little huts, if you like, you know, the tower, you know, it was, it, it was really the beginning of something big, because we didn't realize it at the time. The Irish government also introduced legislation to make Shannon the world's first duty-free airport. As Brendan Regan wanted to do, and to attract in from other countries so many people, and, uh, and this was the only place that where many foreigners would, would get their total impression of what Ireland was about and uh, been impressed, I'd say, by what they met and their experience, and they would pass on through Europe or back the other way, and their view of Ireland would be enhanced by what they, have, what they saw down here. And Shannon became this metropolis, and you had then the development of bases at Shannon for you know, these exotic airlines, all the American carriers, Pan American, Trans World Airlines, Alitalia on the European side, Lufthansa, Imperial Airways, Air France. So you had this great buzz around Shannon. Doing that, building the runway, opening Shannon up, uh, making it a, a place for, uh, for a transatlantic stopover, that's something which involved a great deal of foresight uh, and which in those early days, uh, Shannon was absolutely central to the establishment of Ireland as a, a centre of excellence for all things aviation. 
It was so busy. It was as busy in 24 hours a day. There would be American flights, American Air Force police are and their families coming back from Germany, going back home. It was so busy during the night. It was, it was busier uh, as it was in the daytime, you know? Every family had some member working here, either a father or mother or brother or sister. I myself had three sisters working here. Here I was getting good money, and I couldn't believe it. The difference in the weekly wage packet, I thought I was a millionaire. There was a guy here, he, he was actually, he was working in, in, in the, the passenger toilets down here. Now, why did my passenger toilets mightn't seem good? It was a great place to be working because he was making more money. He was making a load of money. It tips and fellas polishing their shoes and he was getting the, dig the dignitaries of the world coming in there to him. And uh, he'd maybe even shave and he was doing brilliant. But he had, ten, he had 10 children, he lived up the back road there. And it was great for him. You know, he, he made good money there. Uh, we had a flight delayed and this little lady, a little feisty American woman, came up to me and she said, uh, I say, young man, do you speak American? <laughs> well, I said, madam, uh, <laughs> I'm studying the lingo, but I said I only speak English. She turned around, God damn it, do I, does anyone speak American here? <laughs> Since the days of the founding fathers, many of America's great cultural achievements have traveled across the seas to bring joy and enlightenment abroad. The twist is our latest contribution. All Europe is gyrating to the beat of the latest from the crazy Americans. And they love it. All of them. They're, they're the latest sounds and everything because there's a lot of city people working with them as well. Come on with these weird sounds from the States. And they have a yard bell of chocolate maybe from America. Chewing gum was another thing that we, we were introduced to due to that. They had their own culture. The dress, of course, was a lot. Uh, rather, we would term it flashy. You know, uh, loud suits, loud ties, the old hats. But people liked it, and I think it did. Uh, people began dressing somewhat like them eventually. It's the first bit, bit of glamour we ever saw, you know, I mean, uh, when we were refueling, and we'd watch the people going off and coming on. And We'd see clothes that we would have never have seen before, number one. Hats and coats and... And the last of the passengers would be going off, or maybe the first one would be coming on by the time we were finished. Ireland was slowly beginning to open up to the world and aviation was becoming a growing part of the nation's industrial development. Aer Lingus, as a national carrier, would become an increasingly potent symbol of that change. I was 20 years old, I came from the country. I'd never been on an aeroplane, but gosh, I was willing to be on an aeroplane. It was very exciting. There's this airline looking for air hostesses. What's this all about? I think I was one of about 20. I think it was about 20 in the art class. Being an air hostess in those days was like being a film star, like being a model. It was something very special because there were very few of us and it was very new. So it was exciting just being one apart from the flying. And one of the girls I joined with was in Waterford and she came up and spent the weekend with me in Cork. And we decided to go to a hop in the Arcadia, which was a big ballroom in Cork. And um, we were standing there for a couple of dancers until Maureen happened to let drop to somebody that we were air hostesses. And then the queue formed from the right. Everybody wanted to dance with the air hostesses. It came in very handy then. It was very expensive to go to London in those days, and not a lot of people flew. So the people who flew were formal, and we treated them in a formal manner. We had regular London flights where you actually knew the name of passengers. Not all of them, obviously, but your regular passengers. The training we had was that we were special. We were flag carriers for our country. We were wearing green and everybody knew who we were. So our behavior reflected good or ill on our country. It was, it was as strong as that. 
individual European countries saw their uh, national airlines as part of their economic policy. They were not commercial entities in their own right. And in Ireland, we were a small open economy that wanted to promote trade. So Aer Lingus developed as an important part of that strategy. And Aer Lingus would have been an exciting employer in an Irish context, because if you think about you know, what was general in the Irish economy, textiles, agriculture, and then suddenly like international aviation, well, you know, where were the brightest and the best going to think about going? Aer Lingus became a place where really interesting, dynamic individuals ended up. And I think that helps explain why Aer Lingus has been a very important, almost incubator for many of the great people who have developed around Irish aviation. You had this wonderful excitement coming to work and, you know, it was the scent, uh, it was the, the technology, um, the sheer wonder of these huge pieces of metal weighing 40 tonnes, being able to take off uh, under their own power. Um, it, it just never failed to amaze me or any of the other lads that started with me. And you were more or less, you know, within a very short space of time, convinced that the, whatever you wanted to do, the potential was within the company to allow you to do it. The realization that, you know, we, we had a huge world out there if we wanted to go grab it. If you get to work for this, this great company, Aer Lingus, you really feel that you're one of the lucky ones. And not only uh, have you, by working for Aer Lingus, have you arrived uh, at a good time uh, in terms of the economy, you've arrived there just on the cusp of their kind of commercial aviation industry taking off. In 1958, Aer Lingus finally entered the jet age and launched their own transatlantic routes. Well, then the transatlantic started, and that was interesting because uh, there was great excitement. We were to wear our uniforms wherever we went, and we were the only ones because there weren't Aer Lingus pilots. They were seaboard and western chartered. Aer Lingus chartered them and they were American pilots. I was so proud, you know, to be going. It was wonderful. It was a long flight, and there were some very moving scenes there because people were still emigrating. And you would know the emigrants, the young men and the young girls, because they always had their x-rays under their arms. They wouldn't be allowed into America unless they could prove they were, hadn't got TB and things like that, and their x-rays couldn't go into their luggage because they met the health people before their luggage came to them. So they had to have it, and it had to be put up, put up on the rack and no um, creasing of it. So we knew who they were. And then it was eight and a half hours across the Atlantic. But there were three hostesses. There were 86 passengers, if we had a full flight. And uh, you just gave them some supper, turned the lights down, put rugs and pillows for them, and left them to it. And most of them slept. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. This is the captain speaking. We're flying at 33,000 feet. And the best we have a speed of 550 miles per hour. For such a long time, people could only emigrate by boat. And then suddenly there was this advent of the possibility of being able to not only emigrate, but come home by air. And I think that was part of thinking in terms of how aviation could evolve as being an important piece of the Irish economy, but also Irish society. The airline was the first important Irish export to make an impact in the States. For the Irish there, it meant a renewed link with home. But for millions of other Americans, it meant an introduction to a legendary island. We met Americans on these flights who had saved up for years and said they would never come back to Ireland until Aer Lingus had a transatlantic flight. And that was very true, because we had long time to listen to their stories, because it could take about eight, nine hours to get back. And you have had people that said, we've saved up, we knew this day would come. And you were the first person they met. And it was quite emotional. You didn't realize how emotional until you met these people. Uh, and that was, that was an interesting part of it. In that sense, um, 
you were sort of the first person they met that they could call Aer Lingus. And we were very proud of that. Ladies and gentlemen, we are now making our approach to Dublin Airport. Towards the end of the 50s, the Irish government expanded the concept of duty-free into a duty-free zone in the vast industrial estate adjacent to Shannon Airport. It would be the beginning of Ireland's long-standing attraction to multinational companies. Well, it came about um, legitimately because of the disadvantage of an area. Um, and it was an attempt at a quasi-industrial policy response that could ultimately attract particular focus and business. Now, the airport uh, provided a locus, and, that, and that's been very important. The industrial estate started off with two small operations. One was raising chinchillas, and the other was a pinball machine assembly. And to think that then when they got the beers and all the large Leninit major companies with thousands of people coming out, felt especially we were doing it for this region that was really needed things to be done and with encouragement to more and more planes to come in. But in the very early 60s, the reality of the dangers inherent in international flight was brought forcefully home by two tragic crashes at Shannon Airport. In 1960, an Alitalia flight crashed after takeoff, killing 34 of its passengers. The following year, 83 people were killed after a President Airways flight en route to Canada crashed after refueling at Shannon. It would be the worst aviation disaster on Irish soil. I knew that there was pouring a cup of tea to phone line. And to somebody we left in the ramp on the bowl that saying that the plane had just refueled, he said it has just crashed. So we all tore into the Jeep and we went up as quick as we could and uh, crowded gathered and I knew what time the tide would be out, roughly. So I went back to the other side of the river where I knew if the tide was out, the record would probably be as sure enough it was. There was a couple of girls there, I remember school girls when they followed me. They got to the wreckage and the first body and uh, they had one look and I can still see them. They put their hand up to their face, they turned as white as a sheet and they started to scream and they ran back. But that was the only thing about it is everything was so quiet. That the bodies and the, it was just all wreckage, human wreckage and, and, and the airplane wreckage and it was all piled all together. These crashes, together with the tragic loss of lives on the Aer Lingus flight that crashed at Tusker Rock in 1968, would leave a lasting shadow on the airline industry and the wider community. Well, I think the memory that's, I would say it's quite seared. It was, I was about four. And um, my, my dad um, had a business uh, in Ennis, County Clare. And it was a great little business, supplying uh, fresh fruit and vegetables to the flight kitchen in Shannon. So I have this memory of getting out of my dad's Volkswagen van at the age of four and smelling what, I didn't know what it was, but it, it was kerosene. And, you know, people in our game, they talk about kerosene in the blood, but I just felt it. I said, this is special. This is, this is something. And th that memory is very clear. Well, I think the love of aviation was every boy's dream. Uh, I grew up in Drumcondra, so not far from the airport. And, you know, like a lot of people would from time to time have come out to the airport just to, you know, watch the airplanes flying in and flying out. So, you know, that was a big deal back then. Just passed over Sydney and Nova Scotia. Quite a lot of cloud around, but you won't be able to see anything. 
I think like a, a lot of people at the time, it was something that we hadn't experienced. Very few of us had actually had the opportunity to fly, but a lot of us had the opportunity to you know, watch these fantastic uh, airplanes flying around. Throughout the 60s, Irish horizons were broadening along with those of Aer Lingus. Increasingly, emigrants, pilgrims, and now holidaymakers were flying to Europe and the United States. By the late 60s, Irish aviation had come a long way. The journey across the Atlantic that once seemed so impossible was now a daily occurrence. One of the many Irish people to take that flight to America was a long-standing Aer Lingus employee who had by now risen up through the company and was appointed station manager in New York. His name was Tony Ryan. In the decades to come, he would reshape the story of Irish and global aviation. But when Ryan returned to Ireland with his family in the early 70s, the world had changed. Economic stagnation and global unrest had plummeted the aviation industry into free fall, while back in Ireland, the troubles in the north had compounded the problems for the industry. But even now, and not for the last time in the years to come, along with Tony Ryan, a new and coming generation of visionary Irish people saw the opportunities. In many ways, this story of Irish aviation was only beginning. <laughs> 